Very good. The No Dams Given podcast uh, here with Mr. Jason Spears. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Pleasure. Uh, awesome. So, a um, lot, of, lot of cool stuff that I want to talk about, but the first is you just took a new job. I did. Yeah. Tell, I did. tell us about that. Yeah. Um, I've been working with uh, Albany Area Primary Healthcare, uh, just kind of on a contract basis, uh, doing some leadership training and development, and um, uh, just uh, got hired on. Yeah. as the organizational developmental specialist mm -hmm. so we're looking at strategic planning leadership development for um managers executives and really all staff and training and development so really really excited about it so you just you just told me something that you're more of a heart guy but to do what you're doing now you've got to be you've got to be a structural and understand integration guy sure so sure. is that and that's probably one of the um, well, maybe that's the question. So what is the biggest struggle that large organizations have? Is it motivation of their people? Is it, tell me, tell me a little bit about that and how, how do you look and see, how do you focus and where are those issues and then what, what do you do to, to make that better? Sure. Well, for the last three years, I've been working with a company out of Ottawa, Ontario, Canada called Rhapsody Strategies. And <clears throat> Rhapsody is a coaching and consulting firm uh, that works with uh, all different kinds of industries and um, all different types of clients. And um, I, I've, I've had clients from all over the world, um, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and all over North America, wide range. And I think really one of the biggest areas that, that, we've, that we find is the machine that people are building. Uh, whatever that is that they're doing, um, whatever they put their hand to, it really comes down to two things. One is the design, the cultural design, the systems that are in place, and the people that are there. And most people, uh, most leaders tend to go towards the people side first and try to address the people issues first. And, and instead of looking at the design issues, is mm -hmm. there something that needs to be redesigned? Uh, do we need to redevelop a system? And uh, uh, so we look at all those areas. So, you know, we've got assessments that uh, have looked at 18 different areas of the business from vision and culture and systems, financials, and all those things um, to help leaders, CEOs, business owners, uh, find out what those needs are and begin to address them. And um, more so than not, it's been a design issue than it has been a people issue. Because you can, if you fix the design first, then, then you can begin to address the people issue. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, what will happen is people keep coming back with the same thing, repetitive things over and over, and you're just spinning plates. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, we really try to help people uh, to focus on the design part. Mm -hmm. Then that will create opportunities to develop your people. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm blanking on the book that uh, just, I just read one, and there were and it, there was two things. The first was what you said was looking at the um, putting processes. I think process management mm -hmm. was the key word. But the other one was, do you have, do you have the, do you have, I can't remember. It was some key phrase. It was like right person in the wrong seat or sure. wrong person in the right seat or trying to move those people around so that, um, so that they're best, they're doing the best with what their skill set is. Right. Um, but as somebody who's managed a, a for quite some time now, it's just easier to think about the person. Sure. Like the whole systems thing is not, is doesn't, uh, doesn't come across for, that's not the first thing you think of mm -mm. because, and, and I think it's when you have a vision of what your company is supposed to be, you just assume that everybody else has the same vision of how everything else is supposed to work. Right. And so a lot of, right. and a lot of us tend to be sort of these, uh, introverted thinkers like a, a lot of ceo mm -hmm. types tend to be introverted thinkers maybe situationally extroverted but but they've they've processed all of those um all of the things that are supposed to be being done in their head and and a lot of times they don't take the time to make sure that it's either written down on paper or somebody's going right. over it or they do write it on paper but there's no training to make sure that it that it goes on and on and right. on and on right um, there's a great book called The Work of Leaders, and it really focuses on three things. One is vision, 
do you have a clear, compelling vision that's easily communicated across the board mm -hmm. from uh, the CEO to the uh, uh, building maintenance staff, mm -hmm. you know, whoever, and everybody in between. Can everybody mm -hmm. in one sentence tell anybody what it is that you do? Yeah. You know, and, and in one sentence, what are three things that you do? Right. So like for me personally, like my, my personal mission statement is I help people gain clarity in their life, in their business, in order for them to become the best version of themselves. Hmm. So really, so, so I, I help clarity and uh, fulfillment is basically what I do. That's from the time I wake up to the time I go to, go to bed, go to sleep. I'm gonna put Nikki on the spot. Nikki, what do we do? I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> <Don't do that>. <laughs> <laughs> and probably I should do a better job of communicating it. But um, over all our businesses, we make people's lives better. Mm. That's our job. Good. And so, That's whether good. we do it through medicine, we do it through surgery, we do it through our health and wellness spa mm -hmm. that we own, we do it through beer production, yeah. of, <laughs> production of beer. Uh, we do it through farming. You know, so all of sure. the, all of those things, we try to make people's lives better. That's right. And I, and I, and it's a simple thing. And it's easily communicated, and everybody can get behind that particular. And if they are behind it, then, oh, here's a great thing. So how do you gain? How, how when you go into an organization, do you help people with jobs gain purpose? And do you help people who are, have careers have purpose? Right. Because that's a big that's difference. That's a big difference. Maybe Absolutely. you could talk a little bit about the difference between a job and a career. Yeah. Well, and I think... Um, uh, just to finish that thought, because I know there's people listening and watching who'll go, he said there was three things, but the, he only talked about one. So <laughs> let, me, let me put a bow on this one. So it's vision, alignment, and execution, okay. right? So if you have a clear, concise, compelling vision, it's getting people in alignment with that vision that communicates the why. This is why we do what we do. This is what. The vision is the what. The alignment is the why. That's where you get the buy-in from your people. And then the execution part is the how. So most organizations have a pretty decent what, and they have a pretty good how. But what most people where they lack is helping everyone understand the why hmm. and getting buy-in and the alignment so that they can even uh, do even more. Hmm. And so, um, uh, okay, tell me a question one more time. I don't know. You're, you're, you're <laughs> <laughs> like I was so excited about the, the vision. Yeah, like, yeah, right. I'm going to go back and yeah. we're going to have a meeting yes. and I'm going to talk about, all right, so what <laughs> we're not doing right is the what and the why and the how, but we got the vision good. Yeah. It's good. yeah. The vision's easily communicated. Yeah. No, well, and, uh, uh, back to jobs versus careers. careers. Yeah, yeah, there we go. I think we'd bring it back around. Yeah, there we go. Um, I chase rabbits a lot, so y'all figure that out in Squirrel. our time. <laughs> Squirrel, yeah. yeah. Can Shiny. Um, yeah, I think it's helping people, if we can help people dream, um, uh, uh, there's a great book called The Dream Manager, and uh, it, it's, it's written by a guy who, uh, in a fable, storytelling way, really tries to communicate that Every single person, even if it's in a, a transition type of role, somebody that's kind of in and out, there's a lot of turnover in that particular role. You know, there's, there's CEO, executive, there's careers, but there's also, you know, how can we make people's lives better? Mm -hmm. We can help make people's lives better by helping them dream. What is the dream for your life? Like how many organizations ask uh, any employee in their organization, no matter what level they're at, what is your dream for your life? Do we even know what our employees' dreams are, you know? And how then can we Hit help? Hit the lottery. Yeah. yeah that's, that's like most employees. <laughs> <laughs> well, most I'm employees working here. Good. I'm working here just till I hit the lottery. <laughs> yeah. Well, most jobs, and, and maybe that, so you're an employer yeah. that has an employee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it seems like there might be a little conflict there. I buy lotto tickets for her all the time. <laughs> Come. I think you're assuming she's not going to listen. <laughs> Surely, I don't think she's ever gotten like more than two minutes into the podcast. Into the podcast. And as long as this isn't like the two minutes that are on Facebook or Instagram, <laughs> I think we're pretty much safe we'll to say. Cut it out, we'll right? <laughs> yeah. The the uh, job versus career. So so recently, so 
so now we have, and I don't, I don't even, so sadly to say, we have between 80 and 90 employees right mm. now. And so I was talking to one of our managers last night, and we, we were speaking just on this subject. And uh, he's a new manager. He's only been in the job about six months. And before, um, he didn't, he didn't think that he wanted to be a manager. He's enjoyed it. Now he's talking to his boss, so I think he's enjoyed it. He, he was very, he sold it. So if he's not enjoying it, but, um, but the idea, he loves what he does, Mm. loves it. And, and part of the problem is, and he has a career like his, he is dedicated to what he's doing. And I think part of the career is I basically would do it. I'm glad they pay me to do it. Right. You know, sure. And people get a job because they, they go in, they want to do a good job from nine to five. But they're only, maybe not only is the right word, but they're doing it mostly for the money that mm-hmm. they get out of it. Necessity. And and then they get some satisfaction in doing a good job. Mm-hmm. And so how do you build that satisfaction? But then as managers, how, how do you, how do you, number one, understand that there's a lot of people that are doing that? And how do you um, both make their life better by, by making it, by creating a good environment for them to be successful? and not get upset that they don't care about it as much as you do. Right. Because that is frustrating. Right. It's really frustrating for bosses. Mm-hmm. And I can speak to that. Mm-hmm. But it, it's really frustrating for any kind of manager who, who is, uh, who's dedicated. Mm-hmm. And, and that's probably, that's a big thing that we've faced. And sure. how, to, how to create that purpose. Mm-hmm. How have you thus far? Um, I think speaking to our vision. Mm-hmm. I think speaking to our vision, making sure that people understand, like in the medical in the medical business, we take care of the patient first. Like, and for instance, like it doesn't matter. I I, I don't like our clinical people to know about insurance because I don't want them to treat any anybody any different. Mm. Whether they have so so they really shouldn't know if people have insurance or not. I've sure. never. Um, we've never turned anybody away. Our answer is always yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's coming in, even if you don't have a vascular problem, we'll figure out where you're supposed to be, yeah. you know, and, and that's from growing up in Southwest Georgia and understanding that, that, um, that people don't really understand where they're, they don't understand the complexity of the medical system. Mm-hmm. And so understanding that sometimes just getting them to the right doctor is the is the best thing that you can do for that person that mm-hmm. day the people who have bought in have stayed with me for a long time mm. and they put up with my incredulity <laughs> or my, my <laughs> somebody's been somebody checking called, out somebody what? Called what? What? somebody <laughs> calling what what, somebody what might do call you it, put up with like crazy yeah. i'm not allowed to talk about that <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I think Nikki's one that's um, that's bought in. So tell it like, I haven't ever gone crazy around you. I don't think. Well, I mean, he's right though. We're talking about the career. You're you're doing something that you almost would do Speaking anyway. So you're doing something you would do anyway. You're just getting paid for it. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how I feel. Mm-hmm. Like my job, I would I love my job. Mm-hmm. I'm just happy to get be getting paid for it. Yeah, so it's a career. It's kind of dream come true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Tell, tell us about it, Bosco. Uh, it's, I mean, I don't know. I've, I've always, uh, whatever job it was, I always try to do the best job I could. I love my job. Um, and uh, I guess it is a career because I've been doing it for a long time. But beyond that, I, <clears throat> I think there's a certain, I think you alluded to it before. You said, you know, most people want to do a good job. They, uh, they get satisfaction from doing a good job. I think it's I think it's hard to, you know, a lot of people probably wouldn't do their job had they hit the lotto. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, maybe they'll find, you know, if I weren't doing what I do on a regular basis, I would find something that I, I mean, I'd probably be guiding on a fly fishing river or something, you know. I was going to be I, fishing. I, I would, I mean, I, was, I couldn't just go into work every day. We were talking about this the other day, Mondays. A lot of people dread Mondays, mm. and I, I I never dread Mondays. Mm. I'm like, it doesn't really bother me that it's Monday. It doesn't bother me that it's Wednesday or, or Friday. I mean, 
Now I do take off half a day on Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> Full disclosure. Fridays are, you know, I, I may fish a little bit. But my point is, if I have one, is that people basically, you know, I think people want to do a good job at whatever they do. I think that some people, when they, when they just, I don't know, I kind of happened into my career. And uh, <clears throat> if, you don't, if you don't have something that drives you every day that you enjoy doing, whether you get paid for it or not, then I think that, I don't know, maybe there's, I don't know, maybe there's some type of, uh, on the back end, you're kind of like, boy, I wish I, I had found that. Mm. You know, I mm -hmm. don't know. I, look, I'm pretty thankful for what I do and I get to come down here and hang out and I get to do some side project stuff. So that's cool for me. Mm. <laughs> and when I'm not doing that, I, you can find me fishing. Yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes it's about, um, understanding that there's people who are wired for leadership. You know, there's, there's a difference between leaders and people who are professionals mm -hmm. right but everybody in any organization should be growing and what is it that we are doing as leaders to help make sure that everybody is growing mm -hmm. whether that's in a leadership capacity or whether that's in a professional capacity mm -hmm. or even if it's in a personal capacity mm -hmm. because a lot of times what's going on in people's lives personally affects how they perform at their job, oh, every day. right? Oh, no, and no. so you never know what's coming in the door, mm -hmm. what people are dealing with. And it'll ultimately, in fact, especially in healthcare, mm -hmm. you know, you have a front desk employee that, you know, uh, just lost their mom to a heart attack, you know, heart attack over the weekend and they've got a funeral coming up and, you know, it's, uh, what's going on? And do we know that? And yeah. how, how, how do we create environments where um, it's safe for people to be human, mm -hmm. you know, and, and especially in healthcare, like, like patient care is top priority, yep. you know? And then, uh, my question is, you know, what are we doing for employee care? Mm -hmm. How are we looking after the people who are taking care of the people who we need to be looking after? Right. You know? So, um, oh, that's a great point. And with, you know, and dealing with when you get into bigger and bigger organizations, I mean, you're basically dealing with a little subset of society. And so all of the problems that you're dealing with through the door every day are already present within, within the little subculture that you've got, that you've set up. And, um, and so, yeah, setting up, setting up methods so that you're caring for them. I, the other problem with health, health care people are that we we constantly put off whatever it will put off our relationship we'll put off our issues and then and I can't I'm blanking on the word right now but you know we focus on cre taking care of everybody else's problems and pushing ours to the side for the detriment and seen this many a time mm -hmm. in medicine to the detriment of your own either your social own. physical whatever compassion Help. fatigue yeah yeah or to a certain extent but you know I I think there's a certain personality that 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 tends towards medicine um, that really likes to suppress and maybe it's because they had a hard issue or they you know there's something about there's something about their childhood and, you know talking <laughs> about the head stuff there's something about their childhood that they bring into their adult life mm. um, that they're compensating for within uh, within the medical system and they tend mm. to tend to tend to put the medical part first and then everything else goes to crap mm -hmm. and we see it over and over and over again and um and i think you can um, you know there's a certain amount of purpose that you can immerse yourself into especially when you do gain the when you do gain a lot of purpose from what you do you can sacrifice everything else to make sure that you continue to do that mm. uh there's actually some archetypal uh, uh, uh archetypal um, representation of that in Batman of all places. Mm. So Batman has no, he has no wife, he has no kids. He basically sacrifices everything so that he can be the hero for everybody for else. For the greater good. And so the idea is, is that if you want to make the ultimate sacrifice, then, then there's a lot that goes with that. Mm. Um, I guess. Mm. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone take a sip. <laughs> <laughs> For the greater good. 
Yeah. There's something about helpers that I think if we're not careful, we can fall into that trap, whether it's in the medical profession, whether it's been um, like I was doing full-time ministry for years. Mm -hmm. um, and you give and give and give and give and give and give and give, and then you're just running on empty. Mm -hmm. Oh, no doubt you about know? it. Well, we had a very good friend of ours um, who was a um, priest here. And, I mean, he, yeah. I mean, a social issue, like trying to put your, and he w he came into a situation in his defense where, um, where it was a church that was struggling. He built everything out, up, and it took everything out, everything out of him and he lost his wife mm. within the ministry mm -hmm. and then that crushed him and mm -hmm. he was done mm -hmm. and so I mean that was a terrible thing to watch but it's very similar it's exactly it's exactly the same thing as I think I was describing in the medical field you know you're so you're so consumed with the purpose of, of driven purpose that has driven you to get where you are that you've sacrificed that uh, that uh, you're so the social aspect of it, mm -hmm. and the people around you need help too. Or yeah, the, the people that are closest to you, they're the they're the ones that are taking the brunt. Mm, no doubt. Um, <clears throat> in his book uh, Lovable, Kelly Flanagan, who's a psychologist in Chicago, he said there's three basic human needs. One is to know that you're uh, worthy to be loved. You have intrinsic value. It doesn't matter what you do or don't do. You are worthy to be loved. Secondly, everybody uh, has a built-in need to belong. Belong to a person. Belong to a people group. There's this built-in need to, you know, for belonging. And thirdly, there's purpose. And so you have, you have a purpose with which you put your hand. So you understand that you're worthy to be loved. Uh, then, then how you fit into the context of community and then how that relates to your purpose in life and what you do. And the problem is when we get those out of order uh, or that we don't understand our worth, and he dives into this thing which helped me in years of, of therapy here in the past three years of my life. <laughs> my local therapist in, in this resource has, has literally saved my life and, and I, I'm just thankful. Um, but understanding our original wound is humongous mm -hmm. and a lot of what we do as helpers comes from that mm. you know like for me you know I'm, I'm sitting in a therapy session and uh for months and he finally drills down and we get down to this it, it, i finally discover my original wound and it hit me so hard because it was a repressed memory that i had for I mean, I, I didn't remember it at all until this moment. There's one moment he asked me one question. I can't remember the question, but I remember the, memory, the, yeah. the effect. Wow. And uh, it was like everything came into color. I was, uh, uh, when I was born, I was born to two drug dealers uh, and uh, uh, drug addicts who uh, just couldn't take care of me. Um, I had a six-year-old brother. I was born to them. And... Uh, uh, at three months old, my dad was uh, in and out of jail, and uh, my mom had walked into uh, my dad's sister's beauty salon in Nashville, Tennessee, and said, hey, I, I can't, uh, you know, I got stuff I got to do. Can you take care of the baby? And she's like, I'm trying to run a business here. <laughs> and, and she goes, well, what am I, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, just, you know, no, I can't. Like, like a family member coming in going, here, I take care of my kid. I got some stuff I got to do. Actually, I, I can't imagine. <laughs> but, <laughs> we won't but probably, name names. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm from South Georgia. Yeah, so. Well, yeah. so uh, so she she uh, she says, "Well, okay, fine." And then, like an hour later, she comes back. But there was a hairstylist who uh, didn't have any clients, and she just watched me and held me. And uh, uh, my mom comes back in and says, "Hey, would you do me a solid this weekend?" And watch the baby for me and she goes well sure you don't really know me but I mean I'm <laughs> you know she says you're nice and you know okay fine so um my mom handed me to a total stranger for the weekend and so one weekend turned into two weekends and uh then my dad shows up the next weekend and hands over a high chair and my birth certificate to two total strangers 
and says, here, uh, I'm going back to jail. Um, she's had an overdose and is an unfit mother. I'm giving my six-year-old to my sister, and I want you to take care of the baby. And he's yours, raise him as your own, and off you go. And he left. That was it. And that became the only mother and father I ever knew. Mm-hmm. And, but little did my biological parents know was that two weeks previous, before, you know, um, before my mom walked me into that beauty salon, um, they, they had found out they physically couldn't have kids. They had had multiple um, miscarriages. Dude, the, you're going to make me cry. And the yeah. doctor said. <laughs> I listened to him preach on, online, <laughs> and I just boo-hooed. <laughs> you're going to make me cry again. <laughs> go ahead. It's all right. Go ahead. Keep talking. So I this is going to happen. So they, so they, um, they had multiple miscarriages, and they said, you know, you, we're, we're not. Uh, doc said, you can keep trying, but you're not ever going to be able to carry. Wow. And so they just, they got together, called their pastor and prayed, and, and they said, God, somehow, he, he prayed for them, and he said, God, somehow, some way, bring this family a baby boy. <laughs> and then two weeks later, a drug addict walks in and goes, here you go. Oh, that's pretty amazing. And, and, and that became the only mom and dad I ever knew. And so they loved me. I mean, my mom is 75 years old, and she's going to watch this podcast. <laughs> And she's going to hate that I told her age, but she looks great for 75. She's amazing. She is amazing. Well, after listening to you online, I love your mom. Uh, yeah, oh, dude, everybody do. does. Everybody does. She's a legend, man. Golly, she's a I mean, legend. I, I love your mom. Like Pete. everything, um, and this, you know, this gets back into the whole purpose-driven life. I mean, yeah. your mom had a purpose, yeah. and your mom understood uh, understood the meaning of life mm-hmm. and understood that there was a higher power and that she was going to be taken care of. Mm-hmm. And she was. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, and as bad as everything got, she knew exactly what to say. Yeah. Maybe not always, but she, but you make it sound like she always, and moms, they always know what to say. Oh, man, she's, mom's she's always, fantastic. Moms always moms, know what to moms say. Moms know everything, man. I mean, it's just. Even uh, when they're putting like brilliant. butter on a burn. <laughs> 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 That's not what you're supposed to do. I know, but <laughs> but but hey, they still know what to say. That's right, they know what to say, yeah. right? Um, so, but no, they were the best, and and my mom it was then and is now the best. Uh, I couldn't ask for a more supportive person, encouraging person in my life. Um, but my original wound was when I was seven years old. They didn't tell me I was adopted. Like you can go on Facebook. And, and look at my mom's pictures and stuff. I mean, let me just tell you something. If you friend request my mother, she will accept because she'll look and see that we're friends and she'll go, oh, great. And the, the worst day of my life was when my mother got Facebook. The absolute worst. <laughs> because throwback Thursday, man, there's like seven-year-old pictures of me and naked baby pictures in the tub, you know, and all that kind of stuff. It's the worst, man. Oh, I awesome. mean, those bad high school years when you're oh, like yeah. 15 and you're going through that MC Hammer phase you know you're just like oh dude this is not good every thursday it's worth you it's got hammer worth pants. oh i had hammer you pants had hammer dude pants. i had it oh, all man awesome. you can't touch this and i was too legit to quit too so but but i mean she's worth the ad i oh, promise yeah. you i That's promise awesome. you um but but my original wound was this and i'd totally forgotten until that moment sitting in his office um the picture became clear. It, it, I was, it, it was outside um, in the summertime. I was seven years old. We were, um, you know, my dad was cooking on the grill, on that red top Coleman charcoal grill, you know, and we had burgers going. And then my, um, uh, it, it, they're leaned up, him and my uncle, my dad's brother, they were leaned up against his 1978 station wagon that you know had the wood paneling down the side and that seat in the back that faced the opposite way you know and all that is so so they're out there and my dad goes hey i'm gonna go inside and get something real quick i'll be right back now my uncle was six foot five you know 220 pounds whatever i'm seven and he leans down and he points his finger in my face and he says you do realize that you're really not a part of this family right and that was how i found out i was adopted <coughs> Wow. And so I walk inside and I tell my mom, I'm like, what does he mean? I'm not a part of this family. And she's like, what? And then like mama bear came out, like Wolverine, you know, she was like, you know, <laughs> it's just like everything. And she went outside and sliced him up and called him everything but a white man. 
as she should <laughs> have. as she should have yeah and 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 really was like like what are you doing why would you say that yeah, what's, uh, we're, we're trying to wait to tell him what purpose does when he was over what purpose does that serve yeah. you know and uh so i found out and in five minutes at seven years old i found out that this this really wasn't the family i was born into and i found out just on perception of someone that mattered to me that i wasn't a part of that family either hmm. so my original wound created in me this deep need to be wanted mm. so my uh, so what that did to me like uh i don't have a need to be needed because that's task oriented task driven and so you know once that's done you know so hey man can you come over hey man i need you to come over and cut my yard okay cool go do that and then it's over yeah. but my need comes from the desire to be wanted so not this need to be needed, but this need to be wanted. And so, because, uh, you know, this is task. Yeah. This is intimate. That's what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I wasn't wanted by anyone perceptually, you know, yeah. you, know, yeah. as, you, know, you know, as a perception. Never from my mom or dad. I mean, that, that was never there. But right. what it did to a seven-year-old kid. Yeah. And so I lived out of that wound for the majority of my life. And so it created this thing in me that I wasn't enough. Mm. I'm not enough. I'm forgettable. I'm expendable. I'm not enough. Who, who I am as a person, I'm not enough. So then it makes you feel unworthy to be fully loved for who you are. Mm. And so then you try to find that in belonging to a person or a group of people. Yep. You know? Mm. Or you try to find that in your purpose and what you put your hand to. Sure. But the problem with finding your value and your religious purpose. I mean, I think religious yeah, right. purpose can, fulfill, oh, 100%. can fulfill that. 100%. Which bring, yeah. So that, yeah. that might bring us back to, um, so I, and I think, so one of the things that I love about your story, it, and I think it's an, I think it's a very American story. I mean, I think it's a very, I mean, it's, it's, it's everybody, um, at some point in your life, there's some tragedy that destroys the idea of who you thought you were. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it's a miracle if you go through life and you don't have that happen to you. Mm -hmm. And so, and so then you have to, so then that's a, that's a death in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a certain amount of repurpose repurposing that you have to go through to work through that. Mm -hmm. You, you literally, whoever that person was becomes, uh, he, he's not there anymore. Right. And so, and so, um, and so how do you know, and the question is like some people work through that and come out on top and are an extremely successful and use that as a positive. Mm-hmm. There are others, there are others who don't. And I, and I think it's such an ingrained human story that I think it's in the first like 25 chapters of the Bible. I think it's the Cain and Abel story. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you can look at how they take, uh, how they looked at sacrifice and purpose and how, how because, because things weren't going one of their ways, mm-hmm. um, that, you know, they chose to really, uh, to hate the world, mm-hmm. to blame it on others, to, um, uh, and to not, and to not, uh, and to allow that to consume them. Mm-hmm. Whereas the other, you know, it, it, and there are those people who seem to just walk through life and everything goes good for them. Yeah. You know, but they had, and the, you know, the, the real issue there is the perception of the perception outside looking or the, yeah, the perception outside looking in is always much rosier than what is actually going through that person's mind. Oh, sure. I mean, they're, they have their issues. You just don't see them. <laughs> you just don't know about them. You just don't know right. about them. Right. They're really good at covering them up. Right. right. And uh, there is, and so, the, but how, where, um, and, I, you know, I think it's religious purposes for the most part that, mm-hmm. that, that separates those two things. And mm-hmm. I, I think it's a huge issue in our society right now um, where people are faced with, with, with that sort of, that personality death and you know then suddenly nihilism sets in mm-hmm. and we're not we don't really have a road and we don't really have a idea and we don't really have a new structure to set ourselves up on because mm-hmm. everything that we thought we were has now been kicked out from under us yeah it's a it's a, it's a huge issue yeah but, but but i think it's a gift 
you know, you said earlier that, that you know, it's miraculous if people can go through life and not experience that, but I think it's a gift. Mm. I think it's a gift that you um, can actually die to who you thought that you were mm. because that's living out of the false self. Yep. Like I was living out of, the, out of a false idea and false narrative as to who I really was. Yep. And so I would try to get from people the love that made me feel worthy. And that was never their intent. Right. God never placed people in our life for them to give us what we need. We find that through him yeah. in, his, in his love and grace and right. mercy. And once that original wound is healed, and see, I think part of it is we, we are so good at numbing our pain. And I think that's the difference. That's the difference between people overcoming and people who live as victims their whole life. Mm. Um, uh, we, we, we numb our pain instead of lean into it. Lean into it, feel it, um, embrace it, and allow God to heal it. Well, we yeah. blame it. And, and oh, blame. There blame it is. everything yeah. other than ourselves. Mm-hmm. I, and I think no matter what happens, one, of the, one truism in the religious text is that we re- that we can we we blame we blame ourselves for the bad things that are happening to us. Mm-hmm. It's one of the only things that we can really control. Mm-hmm. So it, it doesn't, and it's everything. And in you know, I don't know the first ten chapters of the Bible. It's everything from a flood to you know persecution. But the only we can't do a lot about that. We can only make sure that we've built a boat. <laughs> that we get out of the, you get out of Egypt. Yeah. That we do the things that we can control. Right. And so focusing on those things, I think, is maybe not perfect, but it's the best way to live. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you're focused on every, all you're going to do is, oh gosh, I, you know, it's it's Eric's fault because I'm just really <laughs> upset that I didn't know about it. So I, I well, can't he go went ahead. fishing when he was supposed to be there for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know how true that is. There's a lot of fishing. <laughs> In the early books <laughs> and the later books. <laughs> Fishers of Men. <laughs> cheers. Yeah, cheers. So good. Mm-hmm. Nice. <laughs> hmm. Is this, is this, um, is this too deep? Is this more head? No, less man, heart? it's yeah, great. Good. No, yeah. it's good. Yeah. I, Go um, cause I, you know, I, I think, and so you were a minister. Mm-hmm. And so um, tell me about starting a church. Because yeah. I really like that story. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard some of your stories. So oh, I'm you have? I'm, I'm impressed that you actually looked and yeah, listened. That's great. I'm honored by that. Thank you. I didn't know anybody would ever look at those. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah when we moved here, uh, Providence Church, uh, it, it was more of a revitalization than it was like a like starting but it was starting over you know starting again um and we had 37 people our first sunday and uh yeah that was fun it was great because you know the board of elders were like hey look we don't have any money we can't promise you anything but hey would you come i'm 31 years old I'm like, yeah, let's rock and roll. You know, I, I, you know, I drove into town and I'm like, I'm looking at the civic center and I'm like, man, we're going to have church in there one day. And then Joel <laughs> Osteen's going to call me and be like, how'd you do it? And, you know, <laughs> you know, and then, and then it's going to be just amazing. And then people are going to, you know, whatever. And, um, so, uh, our first Sunday was 37. Our second Sunday was like 30. And so I'm like, Oh, right so not everybody's appreciative of what we're doing here and um so but i mean it was hard it was so hard um the first three years and you know we would get to about 100 people and then we'd get to about 120 and then we thought we were rocking it and and uh, i remember we took out chairs you know because we had all these chairs in there and you know i would get up on Sunday and I could shoot like a buckshot and not hit anyone. Right. <laughs> They're all scattered. You say, amen. And then everybody leaves, you know, while you're praying and you wake up and there's like, like you, you know, getting them praying, you look up and there's like nobody there. You're like, well, what happened to everyone? Where'd they go? You said, amen. And you said, amen. And they, they're out. Um, and, uh, and, but man, I'm telling you, I'll never forget sitting at, like, I, I drove it. Like I, I, 
I had to cut my salary there and got a job and was working. I never forget leaving the office and then pulling in to the church parking lot. It was pouring down rain. And I just said, God, you didn't bring me to Albany, Georgia uh, to, to, to do just this. And I said, what do you want me to do? And, you know, I feel like God speaks to us in ways that we can understand and hear. And I, I speak fluent sarcasm. And so, <laughs> and, so, and so I said, God, what do you want me to do? And, and I just felt like I heard him say, go take care of people. Well, f- well, first off, finally, I'm glad you asked me what you want me to do. That's right. good. After three yeah. years, it took you it's about time, about time. <laughs> um, but, but then it was, go take care of people that nobody else wants, and mm-hmm. I'll take care of the church. We were so focused on trying to get people to come to the church that... Uh, and and get inside the building mm. and that, hey, go take care of people that nobody else wants mm. I'll take care of all the other stuff right. because Jesus never asked us to pray for souls never he said pray to to the Lord of the harvest mm. pray to the Lord of the souls that that he will send laborers to go into the harvest field with you mm. that was powerful for us and that's what we started doing so then, so then, you know, we start going once a week. I called Doug McClure, Captain Doug, when he was at, at Salvation Army and said, what do you need? What do you need? I've got a handful of people. I have no money. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what can we do? He said, man, I would love to give my staff a night off where they could actually have dinner with their families. And I said, well, we'll come cook and clean up and do Thursday, you know, a night for you. He goes, Tuesday night, done. And so for like five years there was somebody from Providence Church on Tuesday night cooking and serving people mm-hmm. so we started doing something uh, for people who couldn't give us anything in return mm-hmm. go take care of people nobody else wants I'll take care of the church is what he said so we started praying for laborers God send us people who have a heart to go out and just love people mm-hmm. love the unlovable you know uh, reach people that that I mean you know right you know like we had paranoid schizophrenics coming to church and it was fun. Yeah. It was great. They really make yeah. this, the they service make service lively, <laughs> man. Lively. Like, they hey, feel bro. The power. Yeah, I'm preaching right now. Your, your turn's coming. Your yeah. turn's coming. But, you know, um, it was great. But uh, so we started doing stuff once a week, uh, once a month, once a quarter, and once a year in the community. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, like, I would never look behind me. Because, you know, I sat up front, so the music is going on, the worship's going on, which is phenomenal music. And, and I would never look behind me, because I'd always be like, oh, God, I can count them. There's 42 people here. Oh, man. I worked hard <laughs> on this message. And, you know. But I'll never forget, after serving for about a year in the community and just giving and loving people, um, I got up one Sunday, and I looked in the back, and they were pulling out chairs. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And that was sta- it was standing room only. Yeah. I get emotional. Thinking about that. Sorry. <laughs> That's awesome. Man, what did you put in this? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> oh, man. I, and, and, and it was it was the dream beginning to become a reality. Yeah. And so um, I remember going to church and saying, hey, we need to start a second service. We need to build, you know, we need to tear down a wall. We need to do this. And I remember the first time we did Easter at, uh, it was Darton then, but ASU now in the student center upstairs. Yeah. It was like 500 seats. And we like, we said we were going to do two services. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, is, what are we thinking, you know? And then it was jam-packed both services, you know. And, 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 you, and you just look at that and go, man, all of that came from, Go take care of people nobody else wants. I'll take care of the church. And, and, and a heart from the people who were already there, mm. who, who, who believed that uh, it was important that anybody and everybody could walk in those doors and be loved and accepted and welcomed. It didn't yep. matter who you were, where you were from, what color your skin was, what socioeconomic background you came from, what side of the tracks you were from, didn't matter. Everybody, the floor was flat when you walked in Providence. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I remember <clears throat> doctors sitting next to homeless people who hadn't bathed in a month. And they sat next together and worshipped. 
I mean, you can't put a price tag on that. Oh, no, not yeah. at all. That's I mean, and, you know, you if, yeah, that's enough. That's worth it. Yeah. That's that guy. Hey, y'all killing me, man. Y'all killing me. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> no, um, beautiful story. I obviously heard it before. Wait, the, uh, I, I, my comment was that the ones that are struggling now need to understand that message. Mm. I mean, there's plenty, there's plenty of people to fill up the church pews. Oh yeah. I mean, the, it, are you willing? And at C.S. Lewis talked about this. Who do you, you know? A lot of uh, a lot of church, especially affluent church, tends to be affluent, and so they don't want to sit next to whoever. Mm-hmm. But that's just not what it's about. I mm-hmm. mean, it's all about leveling you down to the same, the, to being the same person, uh, mm-hmm. the same, to being not having that judgment no matter you know no matter right. what it is open the doors for everybody there's mm-hmm. plenty of people that will come in now you know they, and and I think that's 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 part of the problem with the with modern churching or or yeah. at least part of the problem um, and I think it's part of the if you get into another thing the the um, uh, the message with the symbolic part of it which is you know I'm an Episcopalian so the symbolic part of it and kind of missing the understanding between the symbolism and then um, then the interpretation of the scripture mm-hmm. and so uh, <clears throat> so so that's that's interesting um, in Nashville Tennessee mm-hmm. um, and I was a youth ministry major okay. which was awesome yeah and uh, <laughs> it was great great school yeah. great university fantastic professors um, I then went on to North Central Bible College in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was there for nine months, and then it snowed. And then I said, I'm not, I'm not staying here. <laughs> so you were there in the good months. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I started my fall semester in September, and then we were like, yeah, no, man, I'm out, dude. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. Yeah, yeah. They have, they have two seasons up there, winter and road construction. That's about what it is up there. So. <laughs> The river freezes solid. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. The first snow that I saw, it was literally, it, it was like October. And uh, I'm in an apartment, and I look outside, and it's like a blizzard. And I'm like, oh, my word. It's amazing. You know, Southern boy, he didn't yeah. see anything like that. And then all of a sudden, like two hours later, kids are outside sledding down the thing. And I'm like, are you serious? How did that happen? And it was, it was phenomenal. And it was like minus 20. And I'm like, yeah, dog, I'm out. I, yeah, I can't. I cannot stay here. I spent two years in Pennsylvania and was so happy oh. when I got to when I got to migrate back home. Right. I mean, it was. Uh, right. I called Dad. I was like, Dad, the river's frozen. Because it's frozen. <laughs> solid. <laughs> solid. Yeah. Right. I mean, people yeah. are skating out they, there, and they like, walk on it. Ice right. fishing. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, don't go out there. Yeah. Hear Did you hear him? Ice they fishing. Said, don't go ice out fishing. There. Yeah. yeah, of course. <laughs> Always bringing it back there. <laughs> Yeah, well, don't go out there. Don't You'll go fall out in. there. Yeah, that was right. My, that was dad's. <laughs> so at some point, um, your and your ministry's not over, but you decided to for a change. How did that? How did that occur? Because yeah, because then you now, then you were all over the world speaking. Because mm-hmm. those are the ones that I saw. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I uh, um, got to a point where I felt like okay, I've done all that I have been called to do here. Mm-hmm. Uh, church was in a very healthy spot. Um, it was very good numerically, uh, as far as church attendance and finances were great and all that. And, uh, I went to our, our youth minister and I said, Josh, dude, I want you to pray about something. I want you to pray about taking the church. And he's like, okay, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> That's pretty much how it went. And, uh, and, and, but I, I had pegged him, you know, years ago, he'd been with me for years Right. And his wife, Bryn, had been with me even longer. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so we did a, 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 a long transition and handed it to him. And when we announced to the church, I said, look, I know people all over the world that I could invite to come and see if they wanted to be the pastors here. But nobody would have the heart of this church. God, here we go again. God, you're all killing me, man. What are you doing? I love it. God. This is awesome. Nobody would have the heart of this church like Josh and Brent Cochran, yeah. and they got a standing ovation. Like, and, and then I'm like, hey, now calm down. I'm still here. I'm still here for now. What are y'all doing? Hey, hey, hey. You know? Um, so, but, but they have taken it. T- 
to such a whole nother place yeah. that I couldn't, you know, and, and it was beautiful. It, it's just beautiful to watch. Like still go to church there. Yeah. Um, I love them deeply. Like they had 1500 on Easter, mm. 1500, six services in that little building in that yeah. little, in that little bit, you know, they've bought property now they're going to, you know, build a new, uh, facility mm. and uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm just so proud of them. Yeah. What a so wonderful cool. thing in a time yeah. when all you read about is that churches are decreasing and, mm. and you know, to have such a great mission and mm-hmm. such a great, and it goes back to mission and purpose. And, right. You say? Intrinsic value, belonging and purpose. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. For real. I mean, you know, all humans have intrinsic value. Y'all went out in the community and proved it. Mm-hmm. And then you, know, you uh, uh, you created a system where everybody felt like they belonged, and obviously yeah. the purpose is within. Re- I mean, you know, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus right, Christ. right. Don't don't forget um, vision and alignment and execution. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> remember he's taking us back. Actually, I, I, just <laughs> <laughs> I read that on his paper. <laughs> <laughs> but back when you said it, I thought I should have taken notes. <laughs> I got you notes, buddy. That's good. It's I'll good. send them to you. Describe over here. It's honest. So, well, it felt like we wanted to um, help other pastors because I know so many pastors. You know, the average church in America is 75 people. And if, if God could do what he did at Providence Church through the most imperfect vessel you've ever seen, and, and, uh, then, then maybe he could do that other places. Mm-hmm. And just to encourage people, because I know what it, I know what it felt like to have 75 people and there was nobody to help you, mm. nobody to come alongside you and encourage you, nobody to go, hey, man, you can do it. You can make it. This is kind of what we did here and did this there and, and all this. Like, I remember going to Atlanta to Andy Stanley's conference. Mm. You know, there's 19,000 people and he's speaking and all these other people are speaking. You're like, oh, that's great. And I'm like, but all those people, they have more people on their janitorial team and, and, than I have in my whole church. church. They have no idea what I'm going through, right? Uh, Andy Stanley started his church with 1,500 people. He has no clue what's happening down <laughs> here, right? And he, he's telling me, hey, man, you can do it. Yeah, you know what? You can just take that on down the road. No, no, I love Andy. He's great. But, but... Uh, <laughs> He won't watch the podcast. No, he, no, he, well, <laughs> so you're good. You're good. Yeah. You're good yeah. Andy, yeah. just in case. We're just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so, so I just felt like I wanted to, to help. You know, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you. Yep. And, and I wanted to help pastors, leaders um, uh, fulfill their dream, their God-given dream. Yeah. And How so, did you get from, from that so, I mean, there's, that's a big jump So mm-hmm. from turning your church over to then becoming an itinerant minister. Mm-hmm. And so how, I mean, you just you start calling up people. Yeah, right, hey, right. hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. <laughs> I'll come preach at your Guess church. Guess what? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, well, uh, for the past 20 plus years, uh, I've been traveling. So when I, when I left college, I traveled with an itinerant minister. Okay. Um, so you're trained in it for two years, yeah. yeah. And so he really, I was kind of his apprentice, and so I, you know, watched and learned. And you know, he told me something I'll never forget ever. He goes, "Listen, when you go travel and speak, they're inviting you to come. So you better hit a grand slam every time." And and because no, no pressure, yeah, no pressure, right? <laughs> no, no pressure, <laughs> no pressure at all. So, but but and and he said, "Know this: uh, nobody owes you anything, and you just go serve and and be who God's called you to be. And you'll be fine." So. Um, yeah, he let me speak one time. He gave me one of his meetings, and 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 it, it you know I I shared my story, and it went very well, and I just got invited. It was it was in Canada actually, mm-hmm. and um, I got invited from there, and then I just built relationships with people all over the world, and um, you know it's a you know life's about relationships, mm-hmm. you know that belonging piece mm-hmm. that really means something to me. Yep. Like when I go speak somewhere. I'm not interested in just going to speak for someone. I'm interested in, in helping that person build their church or their organization or, you know, uh, I've had the privilege to speak at, at um, you know, businesses and all this stuff. But I'm not interested in just, you know, th- this is just a one-off event. No, no, no. I, I, I want to build relationship with you. I want to know you. I, I, like, I want to know what makes you tick. I want to know how I can help add value to you and what you do. So when I go speak somewhere, I'm just not rolling in going, Hey, guess what? But I, you know, and then and then I leave, and then you know, I want to know what it is that you need. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I think in one of the, in the, some of the ones from Australia, in at, maybe this is the way you mm-hmm. always do them. You had something with the guys or with a smaller group the night before. Oh yeah, yeah, and then yeah. It's like a men's thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Is that for is sure. that kind of how you do it and get to know yeah. what their issues are? And yeah, then right. Tailor it to that. Yeah. Well, well, for Australia, my friend Shane Willard, uh, who comes to speak here once a year uh, at the church, is uh, he's been in Australia for for sixteen years, and we go back. We were on staff together in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, at a church when we were like 24 years old and uh, we've just been friends ever since and he's one of my dearest friends on the planet Mm -hmm. and when he found out I was uh, you you know what I wanted to do and leaving the church and everything he said buddy he goes uh, what you have on your life Australia needs he said I've been here for 16 years so I'm going to open up Australia for you I was like wow no pressure (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right, right. So, so uh, he introduced me to a couple people, and 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 I just go over there, and and things, you know, went went pretty decent, and um, got invited back, and you know, really started to grow and develop, and 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 it was great. And Australians are incredibly relational people, and that's that's one of the biggest differences I learned about the Australian church and the American church, where um, uh, every church is online live streaming you know if you can't make it to church that's fine just sit in your pajamas and watch church popcorn here. yeah popcorn get your popcorn ready and you know grab a sholey <laughs> and this you know you can give online you know and and, and do all that but, uh, but in australia <laughs> he's just kidding nine eleven he's just in the kidding. morning <laughs> yeah right he's just kidding come to church yeah, yeah. Church. right but 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 that's kind of what's happening in in our culture down there so my mom my mother okay here we go texts me and says hey are they streaming live and i'm like i don't know hey man are y'all streaming live and he looks at me like i'm an alien and he's like no they got cameras everywhere and all this stuff he goes we record it and then post it on monday he goes why would we give people another reason not to come to church and i went what they're four years over there are bigger than their sanctuaries mm. huh. because they value community and connection that much. Eight yeah. percent of Australia is is Christian, mm. so when they come together, they value that deeply. Yeah, and so that's the biggest difference that Did I you say saw. Eight eight percent out of twenty seven million people. Wow, wow. Mm-hmm. that's all. Mm-hmm. Now they're the nicest people on the planet. They're mostly in the outback. The 8% no, I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just yeah, made it's fascinating. It's that yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So what are the other percent? Nothing? Just nothing. They just, right on, mate. Right on, mate. Yeah. yeah. They're just doing their thing. That's so interesting. Yeah. Huh. Culturally, just so different than what, oh, yeah. what we would expect. Right, right. So let's all come here. The, like the purpose for Sunday morning is for us to come together around the word let's worship together yeah let's learn something but it's for us to be together like people show up 30 minutes early the place is packed like let's say service starts at 10 9 30 people it's it, who's going to be there is there for the most part and i'm like dude <laughs> this never happens and the only you know you get parents dragging their kids in with one shoe on you know and you're just like get in there you know and during your sermon <laughs> yeah right right, <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, but there, man, they, they value, they have a full coffee bar and breakfast and all this stuff. And, and there's tables and chairs and, and uh, it's, it's phenomenal. And people stay an hour after church is over. Oh, wow. It's unreal. <laughs> yeah. And that's everywhere. Like, like I spoke at, I don't know, I spoke, what, in 37 days, I spoke 42 times. Mm-hmm. And uh, so apparently I think you're going to speak longer because they're still hanging out. He's still hanging around. <laughs> Is he done Is yet? he done? Is well, he done? I think he's no. coming back from yeah. Uncle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe if we hang around. Yeah. 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 He might say something else. He might say something else. Maybe. Better. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. So, it's fascinating. Um, so servant leadership. Mm-hmm. So one of, the, one of the things or one of the concepts that I really like um, and try to preach that this within our organization because I'm totally changing subjects. I'm going, 
Sorry. I felt that transition. Yeah, right totally changed yeah. the subject. Sorry. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so it might be the two beers I've had. Yeah. <laughs> but I, there's a couple of things I want to get into. And so um, I, there's this concept that if you, uh, and I think it's servant leadership, but it, there's this concept that if you fix something about yourself, that you also fix something about society. Mm-hmm. And so if you, um, for instance, <clears throat> for instance, uh, uh, if I'm having trouble doing something and I correct that about myself, then suddenly I become an advocate to help other people correct that about themselves. Absolutely. Because there's nothing that I, one of the things to understand is that we all sit, face the same problems in life Yeah. and that there's nothing that I can, there's nothing that I come, come in contact with that at some point somebody else is not dealing with. And by dealing with those issues well, and being willing to talk about them mm-hmm. and be willing to show other people how to deal with them. Mm-hmm. And so, and that's a good model for servant leadership and also how to build purpose and, you know, looking in, in our organization and how to build purpose within inside the organization, find those things that you can deal with and make those things better that are in front of you mm-hmm. and you'll make our organization better. Oh yeah, yeah, no doubt. So fix the little problems and don't be worried cause I'm not going to get upset with you just cause it's a problem. Right. Because I think that because we went back to to people and probably the biggest misunderstanding that I had in the very beginning was getting upset every time we found a problem. Mm. Mm. But that's actually wonderful. Yeah. Finding the problems that way you can fix them. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Please tell me. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Let me know. That's great. Please, yeah. We can <laughs> stop that. Please tell me. Please yeah. stop <laughs> telling me everything's going so great. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, no doubt. What yeah. happens when the guy that's in charge is actually the problem? Oh, that's Ooh, a very that's good, a good question. Uh, but I, yeah. <laughs> Nikki, you wanna, was I that directed at someone? She suddenly just spoke up. Come I on. threw it out there. I, 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 <laughs> you were gonna, you were gonna tell Eric what to do about his problem. Yeah, uh, problem I need some. I actually, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what my problem is. He no, purposely big, is not sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The biggest thing about that I can help you is with trying that. to do because you are in charge and so you you can fire yourself, but it's very uncommon to fire yourself. Sure. Um is create an atmosphere where they tell you that you're screwing up. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that's hard, okay. that is really hard to do. Yeah, and, and, and letting that be okay. And letting that be okay. Right. Yeah. For the for the sake of the overall cultural health of the organization. Yep. Right. Yep. Some some places won't go any farther than where the leader is. They just won't. Mm. You know, if 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 the leader's maxed out and if they can't listen, if they can't hear anything, if they have to always be right, if they're narcissistic and, you know, they can never be wrong. Well, then, you, you know, there's going to be you can only motivate people with sticks and carrots for so long. Right. You yeah. know, well, no doubt. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because they eat the carrots. Yeah. Yes, they do. <laughs> Sometimes they eat the sticks. Sometimes. <laughs> 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 Those people. Uh, that yeah, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, if we want to experience lasting change, especially as it relates to leadership and servant leadership, mm-hmm. like you said, fix yourself, you know. Fix something, that, fix, fix something wrong fix with Fix something society. else wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fix yourself, fix others. You know, you, well, I have a severe depression issue, not personally, but I'm just as an example. So, but I find a way to overcome it. And then suddenly I'm dealing with other people who have depress, d- depressive disorders. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. And, the, and it may be friends, it may be colleagues, it may be whatever, you know, it may be those, those things because we all deal with those issues. Right. We all deal with them. Right. And so coming, coming to a, if you can fix something about yourself, you will find something in your in your community that suddenly you're that you're good at. Or uh, that's not the right word. But well, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like look at the Apostle Paul, for instance. Mm. Uh, we, you know, before he was who he was, he was a great persecutor of Christians, yeah. right? And so, the, the, I mean, there were he had blood on his hands. Had an excellent excellent track record. Track record. For persecuting Christians. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he Amen. was he, he was, was top he was, shelf. He was good. He was very good. Yeah. He yeah. was also a, as good a Jew as you could possibly be. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. So so when he has this encounter with Jesus and he says, Why are you persecuting me? He's like, Wow. And says his whole life has changed. Now he's all he wants to do 
is, is encourage other people, especially in the Greek world, about who Jesus is. Mm. And uh, then, so he, he has, you know, uh, the Jewish Christians don't appreciate that he's telling people that, that, hey, you don't have to be circumcised in order to follow Jesus, to which all the Greek men said, amen, you know, um, you know, because I mean, imagine Especially being like... the ones over one. Re- yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're... The one's old enough to vote. Yeah, you're 23 years old and you're like, oh, I have to do that to follow Jesus? Let me rethink this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because back then it's not as, you know, pronounced as it is now. You know, back then it's grab a rock, swing hard, don't miss, right? So, I mean, you just got to do what you got to do. It's a bad day. It's a bad day. It's a bad day. So, you know, to hear that, you're like, amen. So, so they get mad at him. So he gets put into prison. He spends the majority of his, his Christian life in prison writing letters to people and finally finds himself shipwrecked on an island called Malta and which is a small island off the tip of Sicily, off the tip of Italy. And, and so all these people welcome him. And, and then all of a sudden, he, 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 they, they've been going for two weeks. Everything, it, they're exhausted, tired. He's a prisoner. There's 274 people on this boat. It, it, reading the book Acts, it's a phenomenal story. And so he, he uh, comes, comes up to, you know, all of them make it safely ashore, and everybody's being kind to all these prisoners. And then all of a sudden, uh, he... he, he well, here, let me go get this bundle of sticks here and put on the fire. And then a, a snake is driven out because of the heat and it, it attaches itself to his hand. And then everybody standing around goes, no doubt this man is a murderer. Like, yeah. what? Like, that's What's the fir- omen. Yeah, th- like, it's a bad omen. The, yeah, like, oh, that's the first thing you say is he's a murderer? But I mean, I mean, think about it. To them, because they said justice, capital J, yeah. Justice did not allow him to live. So justice was the god of retribution mm-hmm. for that part of the world. Mm-hmm. So I said they were shipwrecked, he didn't die. But now he's going he's a prisoner obviously, so he's done something. So now he's been bitten by you know by a venomous snake. So now okay, he's going to die now. So he must have been a murderer cuz justice is killing him. Yeah. Well, there's so, Sicilians, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, right. That's how it works. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he's he's going to sw- swim with the fishes, sleep with the fishes, he's whatever this. With the fishes. Yeah. Right. Put a horse head in his bed. Uh, so, uh, so but but the scripture says that he shakes that snake off back into the fire and suffers no ill effects. And so all the people go, "Wait a minute. This guy must be a god because he overcame justice." justice. Yeah. And so 3 days later, he's with the governor Right. So this guy must be somebody. So the governor says, hey, man, listen, my dad is dying. Can you go go do what you do? Because <laughs> apparently you have something going on. <laughs> go do what you do for my dad. And he's like, sure. So uh, he goes in and prays for him. And it's, it's fascinating. The Bible says it doesn't leave out any detail. And he lays his hands on him. Plural hands. Lays his hands on him, prays for him, and he's healed. And it. To me, that's, that's, that's incredible because when he was bitten by the snake, they said, no doubt, he's a murderer. But who was he before he was? Paul, a great persecutor of Christians. So they were right. So all of a sudden, his past caught up with him. And the pain of his past caught up with him in that moment. And he could have just left that snake right there in his hand and sat down and just be like, well, they're right. <laughs> they're right. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, but instead he's like, no, 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 no. That's not who I am anymore. Thanks be to God. Yeah, they, you're right. That's who I was. This is who I was. But thanks be to God, that's not who I am anymore. And then three days later, after what should have killed him, he goes in and prays for somebody, and he lays his hands on him. I mean, think about it. There's a snake bite right here. And you're like, hey, let me pray for you. Somebody goes, Hey, man, what happened to your hand? <laughs> right? Why is it so yeah. swollen? Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, well, like, it's a dry bone. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's not a problem. <laughs> but the same place that caused him pain and should have killed him was the same place that God used to bring healing in someone else's life. Mm-hmm. And there's power in our pain. There's purpose in our pain. And if we allow God to use that, there's no telling what would happen in people's lives. Mm-hmm. So to your point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was an awesome story. Mm. Uh, we read Acts. Didn't we read Acts? I read it daily. 
just because yeah, I like to know what Paul's up to. We have, <laughs> we have a Bible study. I, mean, I think we've done all the Gospels, and I can't remember if we did Acts. We did Acts. Yes. We did, yeah. I might have missed and that. I might have missed that day. We do a little C.S. Lewis. <laughs> 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 Acts 28. Yeah, when we, we, we do yeah. alternatives. When he got bit by the snake. That yeah. was, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and so I don't know where, where this will go because we're talking, because we're going to go into the part where the head part and mm-hmm. not the heart part. Because I really like um, the philosophy of religion. Mm-hmm. And I think part of, uh, I think part of, getting getting modern people to come uh, I think part of part of getting modern people to come is getting more people like you that will go out and and spread purpose mm. I think that's a that it's lost a, a lot in our society there's not a there's not a good place for people to find purpose uh, people try to find purpose in their jobs but a lot of times that I mean that's that's difficult to do uh, in a lot of jobs because mm-hmm. um, it'll never be enough yeah, right, right, right. No you matter how to, good you are, it has are to be something higher. There, yes, you you have to reflect what you see yourself on, and when you're reflecting to God's purpose, you're reflecting on something that's never attainable. But that's fine. Mm. I mean, it's you know, perfection is not attainable. Thus, mm-hmm. the definition of perfection. Right. And so, but what a great thing because you know you look at it, you're constantly trying to strive for it, but you don't have to feel um, you don't have to feel small about not mm. getting there right whereas if you're constantly looking for other people to find that perfection then you'll always fail mm. because there's always i mean there's always a michael jordan that's better in basketball yeah, right i mean there's always right. a baseball player that's going right. to be better than better than you are uh, people try to find purpose in their jobs but a lot of times that i mean that's that's difficult to do uh, in a lot of jobs because mm-hmm. um, it'll never be enough yeah, right. 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 No you matter how to, good you are. It has are to be something it. higher. There, yes. You you have to reflect what you see yourself on. And when you're reflecting to God's purpose, you're reflecting on something that's never attainable, but that's fine. Mm. I mean, it's you know, perfection is not attainable. Thus mm-hmm. the definition of perfection. Right. And so, but what a great thing because, you know, you look at it, you're constantly trying to strive for it, but you don't have to feel, um, you don't have to feel small about not mm. getting there right whereas if you're constantly looking for other people to find that perfection then you'll always fail mm. because there's always i mean there's always a michael jordan that's better in basketball yeah, right i mean there's always right. a baseball player that's gonna right. be better than better than you are um but <clears throat> but where i was going was the symbolic part of religion uh is where i grew up mm. and and i've done a, a lot of thinking about this and so and and it's really the 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 transition of the church from say the Catholic and the Episcopal Church to the more modern Baptist, uh, Methodist, um, Lutheran, whatever mm-hmm. the the Reformed religion. But and I got this from listening to or reading uh, Union philosophy, and also um, a guy named Jordan Peterson. Mm-hmm. But looking at the um, looking at the so. So you have to think about what the early church was trying to do. So they're trying to get the word of God to uh, to people who who were very uneducated, hmm. and so less than you know probably point one percent of the population could actually read. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting from a psychological point of view to understand what that even means because if you can't read, then you have to you have to have an incredible memory, mm-hmm. and you also classify things a lot differently. Hmm. You classify you'll put a lot of things symbolically or you you'll combine a lot of things into symbols whereas um and that's and that's because of your memory trying to trying to keep those things down and so if you actually go through how the catholic um the catholic service or the episcopal service works everything has a symbolic meaning Mm -hmm. and all of it and all of it relates back to scripture but it all has a symbolic meaning and so my thought on that was that as it moves through and you get more people that are becoming educated and then also there was obviously some things that were going on that weren't necessarily good within the church that then they got they they went into um they went in they went into people who have a little um uh, a little more a little more education or there were more priests that were there suddenly the bible's being interpreted into more languages with the invention of the printing press mm-hmm. And people wanted more than just that, or they're, 
evolved is probably not the right word, but their their sense of need changed from what from just the symbolic understanding of it to actually the interpretation of the actual scripture, mm. and that was a and that was a. Um, and I think that's a huge difference between how the Methodists and the Baptists even today go about things as opposed to what like Catholics and Episcopals do. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I mean, it's like not, it's like not upgrading, like they didn't upgrade. Like here you've gotten to this point and we've gotten, <laughs> you've gotten a, a more modern person. They want more out of what's going, they like what you're, what you're serving, but they want more out of it. And then suddenly, um, that was probably going on in more places. But Luther interpreted it, mm-hmm. and then suddenly we've got the, the uh, Bible interpreted or yeah into multiple different languages. And suddenly you go from this symbolic representation of what's going on to people actually interpreting the scripture itself. Mm. And I think that's brilliant. Mm-hmm. But one of the problems with taking that one step further is looking at how um, there's you could interpret. There's a there's an even better and we can talk a little bit about this. I want to hear your thoughts on what I just said. Mm -hmm. So, but, um, but I think there's an even that you can take that even step further, um, looking at it psychologically, which modern, more modern scientific, well-educated people could look at and accept both the old version of what's going on as being perfect and true. And, and also look at it from sort of a evolutionary religious purpose and that also being true and the two things being overlapped <coughs> as a single truth right yeah that was pretty deep right there bro it was yeah man yeah. that was a lot yeah. of words <laughs> <laughs> coming, out of, coming out of your mouth that's really good yeah um you know i think the job so, hold on so uh, maybe i'll make it a little easier <laughs> for you so the symbolic religion versus the symbolic religion versus just um how about the, ritualism I, Ritualism versus versus scripture. There you go. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Ritualism Break that versus down. scripture. Yeah. That was like one sentence for me. <laughs> versus <laughs> thanks. Eight paragraphs. Yeah. <laughs> you had to have the backstory. Yeah. No, I think um, any job of an interpreter of scripture is is to like to make the Bible readable mm-hmm. for the people that you're trying to get it in the hands of. Sure. You know, and so can they understand it the best that you can interpret it the best way that they would understand it? Mm-hmm. And I think the greatest way, like, I mean, look at like, like how can we impact today's culture and society with the scripture? Yep. It's the power of story. Yes. I mean, look at the like the scripture is full of stories mm-hmm. that are powerful and profound you know like just in 10 verses in acts 28 1 through 10 was this whole snake thing Mm -hmm. right um telling that story that that that's compelling stuff telling the story of the life of joseph you know and being able to communicate it in such a way where people can understand it and apply it so and and just so just in case if andy stanley is watching he said the greatest way that we can uh, give culture uh, the scripture is to make it clear as mud, memorable, understandable, and doable. Mm-hmm. That's the greatest way we can communicate. And, and I think that's, that's powerful. You've always got three things. Well, psychologically, uh, we remember things in threes. Things. I, I like yeah. the way he does that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just, okay, back to your point. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's that, that's, that, that's that preacher thing coming out from sorry, years I'm ago like, of training. Yeah, just, three points in a poem. Later, I'm going to read you a poem, and it's just really going to bring it all together. Trinity, three. <laughs> How many books in the New Testament? <laughs> three cubed. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, that's <laughs> pretty good. Oh, oh, math geek. <laughs> cubed. But I think it's telling I the like story, threes. right? Yeah. So regardless if your tradition is Episcopalian or Catholic or Lutheran or like I grew up in a non-denominational church. And so it was just, you know, it was contemporary music. And, you know, uh, my pastor went through verse by verse of the Bible and just taught. And it was all life application. Like, how can we take these powerful words mm-hmm. and, and, and allow them to transform our life? so that we can help make people's lives better. Yeah. Not only our own, but others, others as well. Yeah. yeah. 
My revelation and had to be one of understanding, <laughs> understanding what, why, and how. Mm. And so, mm. and I mean, I'm a, I'm a scientist, and mm-hmm. I am been a sci- My mom was a science teacher, and my brain works through mathematics and logic, and just my grandmother telling me that the Trinity was real, and that's I just needed to accept it, and I'd find out when I died. Right. Yep. And so it was just it wasn't it wasn't enough mm-hmm. for it wasn't enough for me. Mm. And I mean, I think I went through um, all of the issues that young men face. I mean, you know, didn't go to church when I was in, um, when I was in, uh, college and then went back when I had kids. And, but I don't think that I truly, um, I don't think that I truly, you know, I, we had a really, um, had a overwhelming exp- family experience with a really bad, you know, thing that happened inside the family. And then that sort of, um, sent me back, you know, back kind of questioning who you were questioning who I mm-hmm. was questioning what you know what my um what my purpose was but I had to go and understand union philosophy and 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 these other things mm. to be able um to be able to uh to come to grips with the whys um and then I found the stories so much so much more profound Mm -hmm. and i really see a um um and for example in in, in the the way the stories are are set up is you know you you really and you'll say that that there's eight percent of uh of australia that's christian but i'll make an argument that uh there's 92 percent that are christian because they are all living out a Christian life, whether they know it or whether not. Whether they know it or They're not. They're Judeo-Christian. Uh, they have a Judeo-Christian religious structure that mm-hmm. they work through every day. Sure. Um, sure. And it's and it's based on on the histor- historical part of of where they came from. Mm-hmm. Same thing with the United States. Even the most devout atheist, yeah, who who claims that God doesn't exist. They're still not out there uh, raping and pillaging and and right. choosing not right. to not to apply Judeo-Christian ethic to their life. Right. Which to me, if you if you think that how how we decide on what you truly are is what you do, not what you yeah. say, it's yeah. what you do. It's what you do. Then then they're then they're acting out the Christian life, whether they want to deny it or not. Mm-hmm. And I don't think God cares. To be well, I don't. <laughs> yeah, that's not probably not right. <laughs> I think in the, I think in the end, He would rather us act out a Christian life. And be a little bit irritable mm-hmm. than 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 the opposite of that. Yeah, I mean, um, with the idea that it, that you're more of what you do than what you are, or what you say. With the same, with the corollary being, um, if you live a terrible life, and on your deathbed you repent, you know, there's a there's a philosophical question of, well, I mean, you know, what what is that? What, what now? What is that? Yeah, what happens now? Yeah, yeah. What is that? Right. Let, let me ask you this. Let me, let me pose this to you because this is what was shared with me. Uh, there was a, a Muslim in Saudi Arabia who uh, uh, was getting a job, was being transferred to Australia. Um, so he, he's all this transition going on in his life and everything is, is kind of, you know, changing and evolving for him. He had like three months to prepare to make the big move. Well, he goes to bed one night and... Uh, he, he has a dream, and there was this bright light in the dream, and the bright light said to him, uh, showed him a picture of a homeless man, pack an extra lunch as you, as you walk to work and give him that lunch. And he woke up, he's like, yeah, did I, you know, what did I have? Did I eat something bad? Did I have bad Mexican last night in Saudi Arabia? I don't know if they have Mexican food there or not, but, but that's usually what we blame it on, right? Bad dreams or bad Mexican, right? Or Mexican after 10, right. you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. Indigestion. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. Regardless of the ethnic food, I don't uh, <laughs> It's probably Indian. Yeah, yeah probably It's full so. of curry. A lot of curry. A lot of curry. Um, so, so he wakes up, he's up, man, that was weird. So he gets this thing, you know, his, his lunch, his, his stuff, he's walking to work, and there was that homeless man that he saw in his dream. 
he was just stunned by it. And he just kept walking. He's like, whoa, that was weird. Like three or four nights later, same kind of thing. The light appears to him in a dream and says, hey, I want you to do this. And, he, and he's like, ah, eh, that's just, you know, bad sushi, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and then so he's like, eh. And then that thing comes to pass. Well, then finally, he starts beginning to live his life. Like he's having these dreams where this bright light keeps telling him, hey, go do this for this person and watch what happens. So he's like, I'm just going to start doing this. So he starts, you know, doing these things. His life's completely changing. Like every th third, fourth, fifth night, some, he's having this dream and it's just, it's freaking him out. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I don't understand what's happening, but this is phenomenal. He's loving life. There's purpose mm -hmm. in what's going on. Yep. So they get on the plane, move to Australia. He has a dream. The light says, I want you to go to this address in the morning. You know, they've been there for, you know, a month or so. He wakes up and he's like, well, I mean, I've done it this far. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well. I might as well keep I'm going. I'm One more to Australia. Yeah, that's right. Here we go. <laughs> you know? we go. So he gets up, goes to this address. It was a church. And the minister was preaching that day, and the title of his message was, and he preached from the text, Jesus is the light. Yeah, beautiful. So, so here's a Muslim to, man was he who has been following the light for, for all this time. So then here's my question to you and everybody yep. here, is let's say that man had been following the light and, and doing all these amazing things, and then on the way to Australia, their plane goes down and he dies. Where does he go? Oh, well, he goes to heaven. Yeah. Oh. And why? Yeah. Um, I don't think the plane goes down. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he becomes I, I Tom Hanks and he's I, living on the I, island yeah, and he's like I, Wilson, Wilson, right? Yeah, I don't right. think the plane can go down if that guy's on. <laughs> but I'm just saying, what if, what if he... What what if he does right? I don't like, think like, it's gonna happen. Or let's say he has a heart attack, you know, no. before he understands. Well, oh Jesus, yeah, Jesus is the light. I don't think. Oh, it's gonna so see. Jesus yeah. has been telling me to do this stuff, right? Has no concept of the Bible, no concept of it. Where so, does he go when he dies? Yeah. So hold on, did he die? No. Exactly. That's my it's point. A th but it's a I'm thought just problem. saying, what well, if we can all play that game? <laughs> <laughs> But my point is, he didn't die. No, he didn't. There you go. But what if? So, so I think that's... He a, answered your question with an <laughs> alternative argument. Right, right. Yeah. He didn't die. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it goes back to... Uh, so... Do we boil Christianity down to whether or not you pray a prayer or not? Right. Like... And so... Um, I don't know if it pertains or not, but what pops into my head is Dietrich Bonhoeffer mm -hmm. and the idea of, um, of, uh, weak, not weak grace. Um, weak, uh, simple grace, not don't, simple. Uh, don't look at me. I will. <laughs> <Dietrich>. <laughs> um, cheap grace, cheap grace, cheap yeah. grace, uh, versus the other kind of grace that you have to work for. Mm -hmm. And so I think if, you know he's ex he's experiencing through his life and through his through what's happening to him that idea of expensive grace he's he is uh he's following he's following the even if he doesn't know it he's following the call of god he's following the path he's i mean i guess in some ways you can say he's following a path of righteousness um he's definitely listening to um to to what the, to what our um, older philosophy would have said is the, um, is the true Christian philosophy that's built inside of all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and so for that purpose, he was doing what he was, he was doing, doing those things that, that get you into heaven. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't uh, heck you know as far as the scientist goes the metaphysical <laughs> reality of what actually happens after that <laughs> right. i'm done with it yeah right right yeah. well we put so much <laughs> emphasis I, on what happens uh after you stop breathing 
Yeah. After your heart stops. But you know what? There's hell on earth. Oh, that's oh, exactly. great point. Why don't yeah. we, why don't we bring mean, heaven oh, to the hell that's on man, earth? That's such a great and point. And help back people to, right now. We could go back to Faust. We could go back to Milton, Paradise Lost. Yeah. Look, we could debate this all day. Yeah. We can talk about all kinds of stuff. But, but at the end of the day, you know, There's a greater power that's like telling us, hey, just be good and maybe wrap up the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Drink a beer. What are you doing to make people's lives better? That might be the question. <laughs> <laughs>